If you're a fan of Nintendo, you've probably come across a platformer or two in your lifetime, I'm at least assuming. It's slightly depressing that this genre has virtually died out since the early 2000s, and we need these back! I'd love collect-a-thons! Thank god something like a hat in time is in development. It gives me hope. So, being the 90s kid that I am, I figured I would do a video going over the history of the 3D platformer. So let's get started. <laughs> So most games that attempted to bring 3D gameplay to the spectrum use two-dimensional graphics as part of their base. These games originate back to when the basic 2D platformer started and one of the first examples was Congo Bongo from Sega in 1983. In that same year, iRobot featured full three-dimensional polygonal graphics that incorporated flat shading as well. Now let's jump ahead to another revolution in 1987 when Square released 3D World Runner. The developers incorporated a similar effect to Space Harrier that Sega developed earlier. 3D World Runner used forward scrolling technology which created the illusion of third-person platforming and it allowed the player to move freely in any forward scrolling direction and also let them jump over various obstacles that were in their way. Now dating all the way back to 1990, wow that's crazy, that was 25 five years ago. I feel old. That's where we find our first example of a true 3D platformer. The game was called Alpha Waves, and it was a French computer game from Infogrames. It introduced a movable camera, fully rendered three-dimensional polygonal graphics, and true 3D movement. It's considered to be the precursor to Jumping Flash, which was a platformer that came out in 1995 for the PlayStation 1 and starred a robotic rabbit as the main playable character. Why can't we get more games like this nowadays? The game features a mix of first-person shooting and platforming, and it was a launch title for the system and apparently gathered a fairly good following until it was trampled by the platform boring behemoths that the world was about to see. However, it does remember to be the first true 3D platformer on a home console. There was a huge amount of prep. Whoa, 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 wait a minute. John, what are you doing here? This is my series. Well, you told me you were wanting to make this episode, and you know how much I love this genre. Don't you leave me out in the cold. Jeez, man, calm down. You want to talk about the Bandicoot and Sanic? That's fine, be my guest. You damn right I'm your guest. Anyways, there was this huge amount of pressure on the big console makers, Nintendo, Sony, and Sega, to make big budget three-dimensional platformers based off of mascots. You know, this was the 90s after all. They wanted to get this game launched to consumers by the 1996 holiday season. Sony picked up an existing project from a small developer by the name of Naughty Dog. The game was called Crash Bandicoot, and it beat Nintendo to the punch. The game was released months earlier than Nintendo's game, and Sega, well, Sega didn't do so good. Sega's American development studio, Sega Technical Institute, was tasked with the project of bringing Sonic into 3D. The project that they came up with was titled Sonic Extreme. It was going to drastically alter the series by having a fisheye styled camera with the gameplay of early 3D platformers. Sadly, due to various conflicts with Sega of Japan, the game ceased production. Ah oh well, at least we got Sonic Boom! Alright, thanks for coming on the show, John. Yeah, bud, no problem. Now let's backtrack a bit to 1991. Here we see the beginnings of Shigeru Miyamoto working on a 3D Mario game. It was titled Super Mario FX. Get it? Because of the Super FX chip in the Super Nintendo? What's with Nintendo naming games after consoles? God. But this idea came about from his development of Star Fox. There was a bit of level design, some technical hiccups happened, and they ultimately decided to put it off for the time being due to the limitations of the Super Nintendo. Now eventually the game would see the light of day as Super Mario 64, which went on to become one of the most revolutionary games of all time. It's still an enjoyable experience to this day. After many years of development, Super Mario 64 finally saw its release in 1996. This game is widely considered to be one of the most important games in history as it set a new standard for gaming, especially in the platforming genre. This showed how to make a platform game work in the third dimension. Super Mario 64 saw the start of many large-scale open-world styled games that rewarded the players for exploration. They were also noted as collectathons. Now having the freedom to explore the model that Nintendo set for us felt incredible. Enter the free camera. This is what allowed players to feel like they were actually looking into the game and it was pretty much genius when you think about it. Having luggage to fly around as a third person camera for the player to use? Brilliant. Sure, Super Mario 64 is noted for some of its horrid camera placement at times, but let's throw it a bone, it was the first game to really implement this feature. And since players no longer just followed a linear path to beat a level, they needed to feel like they were immersed, like they had a reason to go around and explore the world. Now we see the reintroduction of the analog stick. Now a common misconception is that the Nintendo 64 was the first system to put a joystick on a console controller. That award actually goes to a system that was made in 1982, and it was called the Vectra. This really is what pioneered the free roaming camera that many modern games have adapted to, and we saw an evolution in the platforming genre that spread to almost 
everything else. Super Mario 64 is what the world saw as the beginning of widespread exploration in video games. It ditched the linear format for a more open world approach, and it really paid off for them. As the player, you really felt rewarded for exploring the world, and it felt like a living, breathing being that you got to roam around in. Many games after this adopted this formula, and we saw many developers implement a dynamic camera into their games. While we see many games innovate and try new things nowadays, Super Mario 64 will always be known and go down in history as the grandfather of the third dimension of video games. Thank you.